Call a meeting to order. Take roll call, please. Commissioner Allen? Present. Commissioner Norwood? Here. Commissioner Siragusa? Here. Commissioner Roberts? Here. Commissioner Stallings? Here. Commissioner Orr? Here. Mayor Pinkinen? Here. Okay, thank you. Uh, item two, at the commissioner's request, discuss any item of concern on the regular session agenda for tonight? Okay. All right. Item three, study items. First item, 3.1. Uh, quarterly VDA update from Mike Cooper. He was here this morning and uh, gave an update to the VDA, but he had to go back to Tulsa for uh, for something that he could not uh, get away from. So I'll give you kind of a brief little update on uh, what happened there. Uh, um, let's see. Update on DSIP grant and Call Lake Water Supply Program. Uh, for those that track the government stuff that's going on, the omnibus bill that passed recently. Um, that received a lot of attention. Eight million dollars of that omnibus bill is coming to Enid, Oklahoma to help. Uh, Four million will help with the uh, uh, upgrade the Ames pipeline with the uh, aging uh, infrastructure it has. And the other four million will help us out with Call Lake. So we do receive some items in, uh, in those things. And they don't always talk about everything that gets into one of those bills because they're so full. But Anyway, uh, just to let you know that that did happen. And it happened because of uh, help that we have from elected officials, but also because we have somebody that's in Washington focused on our needs that was able to bring that up. So uh, anyway, uh, just discussed that we'll be doing the Washington DC legislative uh, fly-in 24 to 27 April. Haven't done that in a couple of years because of COVID, probably three or four years. Uh, but anyway, we're planning on doing that this year. Um, talked about the uh, Consolidated Operations Center and dorms out at the base. Consolidated Operations Center is a fairly expensive uh, project that they're trying to do at the base that's going to try and house all of the flight line operations within a single building. Uh, the buildings that are out there have been built kind of hodgepodge through the years. Uh, when they were built, there was not fiber optic and all the things that are common in buildings today. So they need to be upgraded for that reason. The way we train pilots today is much different than we did even 10 years ago. So there's a lot of reasons that they need to upgrade that. But uh, anyway, that's going to be the number one probably uh, uh, item at advance to try and get funded in Milcon. <coughs> uh, also talked about... Uh, Oklahoma Strategic Military Planning Commission might be able to help with some uh, alternate energy uh, projects for Vance. So that's at the very early stages, but it's hard to talk about that. And got a brief update on the Woodring Regional Airport projects that are coming up. So that's kind of what happened. That's Cliff's Notes version. If anybody had any specific things or questions, you can see me afterwards and we'll talk about that. Okay. Item 3.2, update from Renew on the wind turbine uh, furbishment, refurbishment facility. Yeah, Mayor, Commissioners, uh, Travis, come on up, please, sir. Um, Commissioner Saragusa had talked to me about maybe uh, asking you guys to come in and give an update. And so I'm glad that you were able to come in and do that because Enid's very fortunate and excited that you're doing what you're doing. So not only by you coming in or you updating the commission, you're updating the public because they're listening and are going to read about this tomorrow. So. Tell us all the good news. Well, we're, we're extremely excited to be here tonight. Thanks a lot for the invite and, and reaching out to us. Um, it's been a great partnership with, with the city of Enid uh, and our project out there. Um, as far as uh, construction activities, we've been able to uh, get our site plan uh, reviewed and approved by the city. Um, we've been moving forward with our uh, general contractor, Henson Construction. We're under contract with them. We've been able to get the building on order as well as all the ancillary equipment. Uh, we're actually mobilizing equipment on site starting next week and uh, the week after we'll actually be breaking ground and uh, putting in, uh, basically getting the site leveled, getting everything ready to go in regards for the building to arrive uh, late February, early March. So we're extremely excited about that as we continue to go. Um, 
we have uh, our uh, electrical contractor already uh, under under wrap, as well as our mechanical contractor. Easily Architect has been a great uh, partner with us in regards to supporting uh, Hanson, as well as our engineering firm, uh, putting the building together. Our customers are extremely excited as well um, as we continue to go, just to be able to provide uh, larger service offerings. Um, we're starting to uh, reach out in regards to the public and uh, you know, starting to look for uh, some key positions to start to, to recruit and fulfill. Um, and then we've also made a new partnership with Audrey Tech, which has been great for a company as a whole, uh, for our, our, our parent company, Tachyon, and all the entities underneath the big global specialized services, which is also uh, a company of Enid, as well as transportation partners and logistics, and trying to, you know, just be able to fulfill our, our needs with uh, uh, employees and uh, service offerings there. Um, I went ahead and put together, you know, some, some quick slides, and this is really just the drawing package right off the site plan that's been submitted and approved from, from the city. But uh, uh, really, the, the, this is just the cover page. It really just shows all the partners that are coming together for this project. It's a big project for us, and I think it's a big project for the community as we continue to go. Um, the second slide, we'll wait for, there we go basically just gives an overview and I know a lot of a lot of uh, uh, members here were, were at our groundbreaking event which we greatly appreciate but uh, uh, the, the the darker colored building below at the very low right that's that's the new facility that's going in it's going to tie into building C as we call in north end uh, roughly it's you know about 42,000 square feet that's going to be going in um, and we have a, 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 a a first of its kind in the, in the U.S. Uh, test stand. Uh, it's a seven megawatt test stand. It's coming in from Germany. We're putting it. Uh, we're working with them right now. It's scheduled for delivery in August. Um, we're working with a couple different ports, but uh, been talking back and forth with the Port of Catoosa, out of Tulsa, as far as being able to get that equipment brought into state side. Um, as you can see, the other facilities there, uh, Building A and Building B, those are full with all of our customers' equipment as we continue to. To store and maintain it and be able to distribute it as needed uh, how much next, how much ahead. renovation did you do on building a and building b leading up to this so since i know that they weren't being used for quite some time so building a um we went ahead and just put in a whole new um uh, a matter of fact building a and building uh b we just put all new lighting in uh, we went in with uh, uh new led lighting as far as building B, building B was put in new back in 2016, and then building uh, A and C were original to, to us purchasing the property. Um, and so we've done a ton of renovation in there, cleaning them up, um, you know, painting the outside, landscaping, um, put in the retention pond out front for drainage and, and control. So there's been a lot of improvements in regards to the property itself to date. Thank you. Next slide is just kind of a, a, a side view in regards to you know what the facility looks like for the east, the west, the north, and the south. It just kind of shows you the, the scale and the, and the size to it. The next slide uh, is, is kind of showing the same thing in regards to the office space. This is lean two that's coming off of the main building. We've in integrated our, build, uh, our bridge cranes into the building. It's, it's all part of the structure. Um, it's kind of one of a kind. A lot of our, uh, all of our uh, piers for our columns are down to bedrock, 30 feet, 35 feet down. Our main columns in the center of the building will be a four foot uh, auger in order to, uh, to support those. Um, they'll be 100 ton capacity cranes, so we're pretty excited about that. Something that uh, you typically don't see in a, in a facility like that. Uh, the next slide is just a, a general overview. It kind of shows you just kind of with, you know, the scale of, of the complex and what we have going on. Uh, the, the entrance is, is right there to the north or to the, 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 the left top side there. And as you come into the building, we have a route coming around. We do have a temporary construction road down at the very bottom in order to make sure that we don't have uh, uh, any hiccups in regards to day-to-day -day business. But... Um, you know, as we go, um, 
that, that might be something that we, we look at as, as far as incorporating permanently. As we continue down the slides, this is just another overview. We can keep going down to the next one. And the next one is uh, of the test stand. So what's pretty neat about this is the equipment that you see here is, like I said, is coming in from Germany. But I mean, we have over 4 million pounds of weight sitting on that pedestal. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a lot of equipment. Just the slave gear box is uh, about 270,000 pounds. So there's, there's a lot of weight that's sitting there. That seismic block is isolated. Um, it's got dampening uh, material that's built into it to not only support it, but also to control uh, vibration in regards to, as we operate equipment, it'll, uh, we'll monitor it uh, for <coughs> vibration and, uh, and log that. So we wanna make sure that everything is, is nice and quiet and isolated. Uh, as we continue down, This is really just an, an overview of the shop, um, and it it gives the details in regards to where that test stand uh, is going. It's going up there in the in the top right, right by the offices. We'll have a control room um, where an operator will sit there, um, and that will on the on the right side will tie into Building C. Um, but as you can see, uh, there, there's quite a bit there in regards to the scale. Um, so. I mean, that's, that's really our update for today. Um, we're excited to get going. Uh, I had a great meeting with Hanson earlier today, and uh, like I said, they're mo mobilizing on site next week. We'll be breaking ground um, as far as uh, actually getting everything leveled off for the building to show up. As we progress, there'll be a, you know, a, quite a couple more updates. I'll be excited to come and present to the, to the community um, as well as everybody here. And, uh, you know, keep you a part of our project. Okay. Are there any questions? Yeah, what's the total amount you're investing? Oh, uh, <laughs> it's a lot. Right? It, it, it's a lot. Um, in regards to all the equipment, uh, the building, everything, you're looking at uh, right around 25 million. It was 100 new jobs or something like that? That's correct. At peak, so we, we have a ramp rate that we put in, um, you know, starting off. By the end of the year, we're going to be um, staffed for one one shift. Um, we'll probably be right around 45 to 50 uh, employees. But as we continue, I believe in 2026, that's when we'll put on our, our night shift. Um, and then when we get to our night shift, we'll be fully staffed at just right at, a, uh, I think it was 96, 97 employees total. Mm -hmm. So just right under 100. So that's a, that's a good memory. Good. Did you want to introduce, uh, you brought a lot of your folks here. Yeah, so uh, the gentlemen that are with me, I got Jim Orr, he's the CEO of uh, Tachyon, um, uh, one of the founders uh, of TPNL uh, and GSS. So it's always great to have him here to support. And then uh, Greg Hobb. Greg Hobb is uh, our project manager. He's uh, obviously a lot of people in the community know who he is. He's been here for a long time. I'm grateful to have him a part of our team. Um, in, in regards to overseeing the construction project, the construction activities and the project as a whole. Um, he's been a great asset for us. And then Brian, he's with uh, Audrey Tech. He was nice enough to come in as well. Okay, good. Um, once it's in full production, how many heads do you, are gonna be refurbished at what rate? I mean, is it gonna be uh, 10 a day, 10 an hour? Oh, this, this equipment, so we, we, we do a lot of different things. We have different oh, makes okay. and models of gearboxes as well as main shafts. So it'll vary. And, and, it, and it does vary. Um, our, our facility in Sioux Falls, so we have one very similar facility in Sioux Falls, but it only has a three megawatt test stand in it. Um, we're right around 250 to uh, 300 um, pieces of equipment run through our facility mm -hmm. on an annual basis. Um, this facility, you're going to see it's a lot bigger equipment because we're the, the scale um, that we're, we're uh, marketing ourselves for. Um, you're going to be in a similar uh, ballpark as far as uh, probably 200, uh, probably 350 uh, okay. pieces of equipment we'll run through there. Good. Will you, will you have any staff or 
employees moving to Enid? We will, yeah. So, you know, what we're trying to do is pull from the community, but there's there's obviously there's going to be some personnel that we'll have to we'll have to bring into the community as well. So, um, you know, that's one reason why we've teamed up with Otter Tech is to get ahead of it, um, and in regards to our support staff, as well as uh, we've reached out to others, um, as well as we have, you know. We're, we're already established with our sister companies, Transportation Partners and Logistics and Global Specialized Services. So it, it gives an opportunity for a career path for those employees that are here as well. And so as we continue to grow, we continue to offer opportunities for, you know, what's your, what's your ultimate goal? What's your succession plan for our employees? And we try to develop them as well. And, and your labor force, are you expecting them to be skilled or are you gonna teach them how to put these units together? So. Our line of work, um, it's, it's one of those things that you, you know, we always look for, you know, good, hardworking individuals that are uh, mechanically inclined, um, you know, come from, uh, you know, diesel mechanic school to welding fabrication uh, training or, or technology schools, um, automotive uh, experience, um, electronics. Uh, those individuals tend to typically uh, excel uh, in our field, but with the line of work that we're doing, um, it really comes down to you, you have to have the basics, but then when you start working in the job, you, you really learn those skilled trades that are specific to the, the, the application that we're, we're working with. And do you have any idea of what the um, starting wages may be annually for an employee that's coming in? You know, it, it, it varies. Um, I would say you're looking at you know, on on average, I would say entry level. You know, you're probably in the in the 50, but um, on the high end, um, you know, there's people that are you know three, four times that. So it just wow. really depends on it. Really depends on the um, the skill level mm -hmm. and what's what's being brought. But one thing that is great, you know, in regards to you know, we have great uh, you know benefits, great opportunities within the company as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, there's a lot that, you know, in regards to what we look at as the full um, compensation package as well. Well, welcome to Enid. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. How I many? really don't even put it in words. <laughs> yeah, thank wow. you. How many uh, support companies have you seen so far coming in to support this project as a whole so far now? Um, you know, we've had, uh, so far we've had probably four local support companies that we've partnered up with so far. Um, but there's more to come. Uh, you know, we're right now, we're at the ground, you know, we're at the ground level. As we continue to go, there's gonna be more that are coming in. Um, obviously there's equipment that's gonna be delivered. There's gonna be, um, you know, I, I know Brian's gonna have a bunch of subs that, you know, for sheetrock, paint, um, you know, insulation, that type of stuff. So th there's a lot of activity that goes with that. Well, I just wanted to say too. I think you guys were involved with the uh, with the community already, didn't you? Haul the Christmas tree last year. Or this we did, year? Yes, sir. Thank That's you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, two years ago we brought one out of Oregon, and this year I think it came out of California. California. Yeah. So yeah, we're happy to be part of that process. Great. We're to continue to do that makes Canada a spotlight, and quite frankly, the U.S. So it's exciting to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Like we, what we like to see, giving back early. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, it's a great community. Yeah. Uh, you guys have a, a, we see a lot across the United States, and it's it's always a joy to come here, especially with the nice weather you guys have in the middle of January. Yeah. <laughs> one day out of the week. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm here for it. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item 3.3, .3, present public safety sales tax report. It's okay if you want to leave. The rest of this may be boring. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that to you. I appreciate that. It's not really. Yeah. Not, not for the chiefs, but <laughs> if you want to know more about fire and, and police, you're, you can learn it right now. No offense taken. 
Thank you. Okay, so as you all know, we used to do this through a safety sales tax committee. Uh, recently, that committee was discontinued. Um, you know, the parameters of how we use the sales tax and, and how those things are budgeted have changed over the years. So the need for the committee uh, was just has, had changed over time. Uh, so the decision was made to start giving this report to you annually. Uh, so from now on, Fire and Police will be giving this report to you all. We can discuss how we budget and spend our, our capital funds. Um, so on the fire report, if you look at the, the top portion there, uh, that uh, <coughs> details uh, the sales collection by month. And you can see that uh, it has consistently, thankfully, uh, come in a little bit over budgeted amounts, wow. uh, which is great because that's, that's how we buy uh, all our big ticket items and, and keep everything running smoothly. Um, so out of those funds, the portion below that is the itemized expenditures that we have used out of those capital funds. Um, this last fiscal year, uh, we budgeted $70,000 for a light rescue vehicle, and that was to replace a grass rig at Station 1 that we've been running medicals with. And the original plan was to buy an SUV like a Tahoe and a vehicle that size. And once we started digging into the details, it just made more sense to us to use a, uh, to buy a pickup and put a bed cover and a slide out tray in the back. And that's why we have a difference of $39,000. So we're able to save quite a bit of money there, uh, which we well needed as the year went by. <laughs> had some other expenditures to use that on. Uh, the next item on that was the $10,000 that we had budgeted for light rescue equipment. That includes high angle rescue equipment, ropes, pulleys, and, and that kind of thing. Um, you saw that demonstrated at the elevator on North Van Buren earlier this year. Uh, our technical rescue team has been expanding all their capabilities and so we're able to do things now uh, that we've never been able to do and quite frankly there's very few people around the state that can do those kinds of things so that's really paid off <clears throat> also with that money we bought some new rescue lift bags and our rescue crews use that on vehicle accidents and collapses and, and things like that the next item there is a 15 knox box replacements this was an item that wasn't uh, specific uh, initially budgeted for uh, but as we went through the process of updating a Knox key system around town, uh, it became urgent that we replace the systems, the devices on our apparatus. So the Knox keys are a secure, be a secure key box on a commercial business here in town, and that lock box has a key for access into that specific building inside of it. Our apparatus have a special box inside of them that are secure, uh, secured, and we have to obtain a, a, no a Knox code from dispatch to open the box to get a key to open the knox box on the building to get their key for their building so that way the business owners are secure knowing their key and floating around and nobody has direct access to any of those keys and all that is movement is documented through that system so uh, we had to upgrade that system the technology changed it used to be a hard key now it's a digital code so that was the necessity in replacing all those units so that um, $23,000 there, that was the portion that we spent to upgrade the devices in our apparatus. Uh, the next thing there is the Knoxbox upgrade, and that is we uh, decided the best way to go with that, about that is to put that on a three-year plan, break it up in three pieces. Uh, it made sense financially and logistically um, because uh, one-third of the business would take us about a year to go replace all those boxes, which we're still in the process of doing. So $34,000 this year, and again next year, and then the third year. Uh, by that time, we'll have all Knox boxes in town updated to the digital system. <clears throat> the next line there is a 911 communications upgrade. That $123,000 has not been spent yet. Uh, we've been in the process of doing research. Um, we're going to, at this time, we've decided we're probably going to stick with the same 
system that we're currently using, but the technology options that you have when you um, upgrade, uh, we're making sure that we're going to be com uh, fully compatible with the police software that they're upgrading. So we want to make sure and do it right the first time. So we're, we're still working on that project. Uh, the annual policy manual, that $30,000 uh, $30, uh, has been wisely spent. Um, all these years that I've been there, 22 years, uh, all of our policies and procedures have been uh, on paper. And it makes it difficult to uh, update and disseminate and educate our people on. Uh, it's about impossible to uh, r uh, search for something specific. Uh, you have to go and look through a document uh, to try to find what you're looking for. Um, so it's going to be web-based. It's be easier to update. It uh, keeps us uh, legally compliant. They, uh, the software uh, manufacturer uh, oversight, uh, they constantly watch legislation and make legal updates uh, <coughs> to match state statutes and things like that. So they help us keep that portion updated. And then our internal policies we can update. And it's on an app everybody has in their pocket. It's a searchable database. They can easily find what they're looking for. Station one roof, the 127,000 has already gone towards our roof replacement. Um, they're over there replacing it right now. And believe it or not, that half inch of rain that we got, or two tenths of rain we got the other night, you know, we have some water issues over there right now, but that's part of it. When it doesn't rain for a year, the roofers things are you know, free and clear, but uh, it's just the way it goes. So we're getting that taken care of too. It's not, it has not been a real big issue. Um, replacing Rescue One, we initially had budgeted $780,000 for the replacement of our heavy rescue unit. Uh, that truck um, has been in service since 2007. Uh, it's about, so it's actually about seven years past the market average anticipated lifespan of that type of a vehicle. So we've taken good care of it. It's lasted quite a while, uh, but it's due for replacement because of some structural damage to the box itself. Uh, so we're in the process of doing that. Uh, right now, and we'll be talking about that more on the on the next agenda. Um, so, with my totals right there, uh, you can see that by the time all money is spent, uh, we'll be coming probably within around sixteen thousand dollars spending everything that we budgeted for this year. You have any questions? Why are we on looking for a new ladder truck? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, something we're going to talk about in this budget cycle. Uh, so right now, replacing our ladder truck and uh, already doing a lot of research on it, the best option for us and our needs is to buy another ladder truck exactly like the one we have. So the ladder truck we have is their base model. It's their old standby and for good reason. Uh, we bought that truck in 96, I believe, um, well, well past its anticipated lifespan. Uh, but, you know, our mechanics division does a great job with it. Our guys take good care of it. So we anticipate that it, it should be good for another five years, uh, which can give us some time to plan. Um, and right now, the market value of that truck uh, to buy one is about $2 million. Uh, but as we'll discuss a little bit more with the rescue truck later, uh, into more anticipated costs in the near future. Uh, and if we wait five years, you know, you can imagine uh, that with an average annual increase of about 3%, five years from now, it's, it's going to be a pretty hefty price tag. So we'll start looking at how we're going to budget for that in the near future. And, and if that truck will make it five more years, then we have time to work on it and we'll continue forward. Well, I was here when we bought that truck and it was $700,000 in that range. And we thought that was outrageous then. Yes, sir. And that was huge. how much has changed. <laughs> yes, sir. Just drastically really remarkable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Drastically. You're right. Well, I was gonna. I was gonna. I was gonna say, I at least got you a little bit there. Yes, sir. Five hundred thousand. Yes, sir. Yeah, and I'm glad you reminded me of that. I've from uh, the uh, deals. So we're it has at been very, very encouraging to see the support that we've gotten in that direction. Uh, the TIF for the renew building. Uh, at the time, I think we were talking about the Tachyon project. Tachyon project. Um, so. Yeah, that TIF does put $500,000 towards the purchase of that ladder truck, which, you know, ideally that will cover most of the increases between now and five years from now. So uh, maybe it will only be $2 million. It could go up even up to seven if our numbers crunch out a little bit better, valuable. Because yes. the, the road's included in that, 54. Yeah. 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 So, yes, that is a very, very welcome 
thing. That was, that was great news to hear that. So. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. You up next? That's me. The police side. Well, I'm not going to be near as exciting. We spent 68 percent last year, so uh, about all we did this year, our numbers that you see budgeted and uh, the actual <coughs> is identical to the to the fire departments. It comes from the the tax. We did with our new training center spent 268% uh, of our budget last year. We're already planning for the future, uh, some big purchases in the future. So we're trying to budget uh, for those now. So all we got in this one is uh, at the end of last year, we spent $22,000 for new furniture for that training center. Uh, this year, we also bought a uh, a $13 or $13,000 drone uh, within the first two months of purchasing that drone uh, we got in a pursuit just outside of town uh, three subjects jumps out of the car takes off running it's got uh, heat sensors on it we put it up in the middle of the night and within 10 minutes we tracked all three of them down had them all three in custody um, these the second thing we had was uh, a fatality accident had the officers go out they fly the drone up they video, photograph the entire scene. They take those and send those to Oklahoma Highway to, uh, Public Safety. They actually draw everything out to scale and everything and send it back to us. So we can do that. Um, I don't know, some of you is here when we were using the total station, which was like a surveying thing, where you just go out with a stick and you spend three, four hours out. Now, a, uh, one of our drone pilots can go out and within 30 minutes, have enough to draw everything to scale. Uh, Department of uh, Public Safety really helps us out. Uh, the software for this is thousands upon thousands. They said, we got uh, guys that enjoy it, send it to us, we'll do it for you and send it back to you. Uh, turnaround was less than a week on the one we did. So that was fantastic, uh, good teamwork between us and them. We're gonna plan on in the future uh, growing our drone program right now. Like I said, we got one. It costs thirteen thousand. That left us a couple thousand in the budget for a couple more batteries that we haven't picked up yet. But we plan on getting some more batteries. The last time we used it is the same where the fire department uh, had up uh, the uh, jumper up on the elevator up, uh, north of town. Um, our pilot went up, set the uh, drone up. All he does, automatic. It goes up and just sits there. And we have eyes on the subject. We can tell exactly what he's doing. If he's got weapons, if he's making any attempt to jump or anything, we have eyes on. We have audio. We could actually do, you know, some other maneuvers if we need to. But everyone on the ground could see that and, you know, keep the officers and the firemen, everyone safe and still have eyes on the scene. So uh, that's the drone program we want. Like I said, we're going to plan on. Uh, to growing that, uh, we have already have some local businesses uh, putting in donations because it is an outstanding program. The only other thing that we had in our uh, sales tax is uh, our reoccurring uh, DIG ticket, which is our uh, electronic ticket riders. Uh, we're on a, uh, a five-year uh, plan at uh, 31,000, for five years, and that just keeps everything up to date up and uh, maintained. And uh, like I said, in the near future, we're gonna be spending a lot more. We have some other things. You've uh, already approved the, our records management software. We're working on that now. That's gonna be 100 or 640,000. So that'll be in the near future. And we've got other couple other plans that uh, probably gonna be a little bit more than that. So um, right now we got lucky that we didn't spend very much, but in the near future, it, it'll start dwindling back down there. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any questions? Um, I didn't Steve, see. Can I be transferred to traffic now? <laughs> so I ain't got to draw diagrams we, on the traffic we, accident? We've only got two traffic guys right now. No? <laughs> so. Um, I didn't see n uh, numbers for December. I guess they just forgot to put them on the spreadsheet. Oh, uh, probably so. Uh, originally, we was just doing uh, July to December. Okay. I didn't have the original numbers for December yet from Annette. Okay. Uh, they are the same as uh, yeah, I thought they'd be the fire department fire. identical. Okay. And uh, I just didn't get those uh, processed over when she sent them to me. Okay. 
Sorry about that. It's all right. <laughs> Just in case you don't think we read them. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item 3.4, strategic planning update. Yeah, Mayor Commissioners, we're going to talk about some strategic planning stuff. And, and what strategic planning stuff means is, is big projects that likely are going to take five years. Uh, some might take less. Some are in stages of various progress. Some really haven't gotten off the ground yet. Um, this is just a rough draft, really. Um, so, so tonight's ex anticipated that we will get feedback from you. And then as we refine this and get feedback from stakeholder groups in the community and other advisory boards, we'll continue to refine this strategic plan. And at some point, we'll bring it back to you probably around budget time or before to ask for you to, approval, to approve it. Doesn't mean that it can't be changed at any time. What we at the city, you know, from having been here about 18 years with some familiarity with the processes, we, we have a comp plan that, that covers about 25 years and it costs a lot of money and I think it's sitting on some shelves somewhere and we look at it from time to time but not enough and um, and part of that reason is because of constraints with with money so looking at this five-year plan there's no there was no thought of how much this is going to cost because all of this is going to cost my guess would be hundreds of millions um, so probably uh, over time we'll have to we may have to probably you may have to prioritize some of this stuff with information that we bring to you so but I think all of these things are needs that you have voiced before or that staff is aware of or the public has voiced before. And clearly, I'm sure we've missed things as we, uh, and as we look to refine it. Um, we'll probably undoubtedly add and change. So let's go ahead. It, Kent, if you would advance the slide. I wanted to start with, and uh, certainly there's several people here that are going to assist me with the presentation. You're not just going to listen to me um, on the whole thing. But I think it was important to, to share again with our, our mission statement. We're here to provide uh, safety, public safety. You just heard updates on what they've, uh, police and fire have done with the public safety sales tax. Infrastructure, we'll, we'll never be able to fix enough infrastructure, you know. Um, but all you have to do is drive around a little bit and you're seeing that there's a lot of infrastructure getting fixed. Um, quality of life, quality of life things are, are, are nebulous, kind of hard to define things, but they're things that make it good for everybody to live here. Um, parks, libraries, um, entertainment, movie theaters, things like of, of that nature. So that's really what we're here to do. Um, our values, actually our vision statements next, Kent. Okay, values are next. Um, we have an acronym called STACI, uh, S-T-A-C-I. And, and you can read up there, stewardship, teamwork, uh, accountability, communication, and uh, integrity. And so this is what city staff works on every day as we try to accomplish our mission. Um, and you can just, you, you can read those things. I think hopefully you have the slides in your available for you to look at and look at later. Anyway, you can read about all what that stuff means. The vision just means we, we provide service and we try to make the community better to live in. So moving on, uh, the Call Lake project's an obvious project. You might say, well, why is that in a five-year plan? Quite frankly, it would have been about an eight-year plan if we did this in 2015 when this project started. It's roughly going to cost about $335 million. It's broken down into five projects. As you know, the intake, the pipeline, the water treatment plant, the intermediate booster pump station, and the chestnut water main connection um, from the new water treatment plant to the old one along chestnut. You're going to probably get an update very soon on that with, with percentages of completion. I can tell you that the, the part of the project that's farthest along is um, the pipeline. I think it's over 50% complete. Morali, do you want to jump in and give, give a brief update on where we're at on that? Yeah, the pipeline is about almost 60% complete and treatment plant is about 35% complete. Uh, intermediate booster station, 95% complete and the intake is about 25% complete. Still planning on a January completion, but yeah. we also anticipate there will likely be some delays. delays. Yeah. Um, just wanted to remind everybody, this project was passed by the people in 2016 by 68% of the folks. 68% of the people don't vote for anything around here, and 68% of the people <laughs> voted for this. 
Yes. So it's clearly a need. I don't, I don't know of anybody that says it isn't now um, that's taken seriously. So it, it's a great project. We're probably, I'm going to say, 12 to 18 months from completion. I, I guess the safest thing is to say I'm confident it will be completed in 2024. And we'll be mixing um, water at the new water treatment plant. Um, is it two thirds, one third? Yes, sir. Okay. But ultimately 50 50 percent. 50 50. Ultimately 50 50. Um, and then I, I always say 50 to 100. I know uh, in all of our reports, maybe we're saying 50 to 75, but this, this should provide water. And, and we can update, when we update again with that water chart about what year it goes out to, and it's, it's a lot of water. So the pipeline itself can carry up to 10 and a half million gallons is what it's planned to do. It can carry more than that with bigger pumps. Uh, the well fields are, remain part of our strategy. So um, we'll have to continue to invest in the well fields. We have around 120 wells that, that produce all the water for the city of Enid right now. Um, so th that will continue to be a need um, and that will get connected. So obviously that's a big project. It's gonna get completed um, probably in the next 18 months or less and we'll have a big celebration when that happens. Next slide, please. There's at least three big projects I can think of that, that um, Parks is probably the biggest one that I can think of right now. I, I know several, uh, everybody I think up here is passionate about Parks. Um, we had a big discussion I think in June of last year about the condition specific <coughs> baseball, softball, and football fields. And so we're gonna talk a little tonight about what we have done in the interim to make those better while we continue to work on the plan, the long-term plan, which is five years or less, um, to replace the fields or to significantly renovate the fields. Needs it, and so I'm gonna jump in first on the long-term. Um, long-term as we approach this, um, well, I guess I should stop and say that um, you guys may remember that Chris Bauer a longtime employee here, community development director, and Carla Ruther, the assistant community development director, have recently, well, they've retired over the last year. So, um, you know, we miss them, but it's been fantastic. It's been a great opportunity for you, Scott, right? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's how we say it. <laughs> that there was a nonverbal. <laughs> we do have a new employee that's starting, I think, a week from Monday, the 30th. That's right. And this employee is going to be critical. He's going to be the new community development director. He's coming with about 30 years of experience in planning, and um, he's, he's done some assistant city management. He's done some city management. He's originally from Oklahoma, but he spent most of his career in California. And so uh, he's got a ton of planning and development experience. He's also got project management experience. I think he'll be critical to our efforts as we work on some of these projects. And he already knows from several interviews with him um, what he's getting into. Um, the parks, this, this will not be, this is necessary. And depending on how we approach it, which you guys will ultimately determine, this will be an expensive project. But we didn't consider money in any of this. But just for um, reference, the new soccer park is about a 20 million improvement that the city's only invested 5 million in. So we invested $5 million to get a $20 million improvement. Wow. I don't have to be a registered investment advisor to say I'd take that deal any day of the week. Um, I don't know how we're gonna fund all this, I just know we're gonna do it, and certainly you guys are gonna lead the way. Uh, I know that uh, EGRT, the Parks Board, uh, other interested parties are gonna help. So one of the very first things we do after our new guy gets on the ground is set up our first stakeholder meeting on parks. And I know there's several of you up here that probably want to be involved uh, along with, um, and some of you are on Parks Board, so that'd be mm -hmm. great. Anyway, so look forward to, to probably having a, a kickoff meeting on this in February um, as we move forward and figure out what we need and want, and then get some conceptualization going and some kind of cost estimates at some point so that we can figure out how we're going to pay for it. But right now, I'm not worried about how we're going to pay for it. I just know we need it, it's long overdue. So bathrooms are on there, new lighting, artificial turf, those were certainly some fantastic suggestions uh, from Grant Mason, I think, and some of his people uh, in EGRT. Um, Grant probably would have been here tonight, but he's got an EGRT meeting going on, so. Anyway, moving on to the next slide. Um, right now, Crossland, if you've been to Crossland, there's about, um, 
eight or nine baseball fields? Uh, there are 12. Oh, well, baseball, yeah, there's nine. Okay. And there's two new softball fields. Um, we're running out of space at Crossland, so part of our issue that we're going to have to contemplate is acquiring probably property. Um, there's a pipeline that goes right through the middle of the thing. Um, Commissioner Orr, guess who the key guy is on getting mm -hmm. that pipeline? It's, it's, it's a guy that lives in Ward 6. Um, talked to him today. He gave some ideas on how to make that go away. Um, we did talk about irrigation at Meadow Lake Park, so I put that on there. That's, that's, that's a big challenge, too. Um, but football, football right now, if anybody's been out to football fields, we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do um, to renovate Government Springs. And it seems like maybe football might be an idea. I'm not saying that's the final answer. You guys will make the final answer. So at any time, this is just um, conversation. So at any time, if you want to jump in and comment or change, feel free. Um, and I think there might be another slide on parks. Yeah, there's some more slides. Um, trail improvements. I know trails are one of the things that that's quality of life enhancement. Um, we've been working on trails for a long time. Morali and I were, I think, we're guesstimating today, and, and probably it's always dangerous to guesstimate, but we're probably only about 25 or 30 percent complete with the Parks Master Trail system. Uh, some of the things that we have noted through conversations over time here is that we need a, the trails that we have up north with the trails that we have south and, and that go from east to west need to get connected. Uh, we're making good progress on that now. We have some, uh, we have the design to Vance Air Force Base completed. Um, and, and the new trail runs to Richland. Uh, we talked about that several months ago. Um, so hopefully that, that grant's going to help fund the rest of that uh, so that we can move forward with the Vance Air Force Base. I know that we also have talked many times about Prairie View School, and it takes a long time to get things done, but that, that is definitely on our, our list. I believe we have it in our budget this year, too. But we've also asked for some money for that, and it needs to be built so that it serves not only as a sidewalk, but a trail. Um, and, and the trail right now goes to Willow and Oakwood. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, this would be extending it over to Prairie View School, yeah. and then obviously at some point it needs to be connected somewhere else. Next slide. Parks. Um, some of you on here, the very first thing on there, you should probably be having some deja vu. Um, this Meadow Lake was dredged. In fact, over by the dog park, or maybe it's in the dog park, there's a big hill. So if you're ever there, that big hill is the muck that came out of Meadow Lake the last time it was dredged. Well, Marley, why don't you talk about Meadow Lake and shore stabilization because it's well overdue. Yep. The current Meadow Lake Park um, condition is about less than five feet deep, the whole, uh, whole lake. Um, uh, the last time when we dredged, it's about in 2000. Uh, it's time to redredge it. And also, uh, we, uh, this all came up when we planning to do the shoreline stabilization. Mm -hmm. So during that part of it, like, we wanted to make sure uh, when we build the shoreline stabilization, uh, is the uh, lake, uh, depth of the lake is good enough, uh, it's going to hold the, sh sh um, the shoreline. So during the process we found out the lake is too shallow mm. yeah so typically uh, lake should be around 50, 10 to 15 feet deep and it's only five feet deep so uh, so uh, the next thing is like we have to work on the store line and also the and um, the core lake the core lake also we surveyed it it's about five feet silt in the entire uh, core lake I mean core channel Mm -hmm. So those are the two projects we need to take over before we do the store line stabilization project. So the uh, material that was taken out of Metal Lake was, did make that hill out there, but the bulk of it went on Evans Chambers property where the core drainage, the core drainage channel where the trail comes around that field. We raised that, I think, two or three feet. Probably three feet is more like it. And so the cost of digging that thing out in the cost of digging it out that's pretty easy to do it's putting it in a truck and driving it somewhere and unloading it dumping it and i'm sure you guys know that but that i so uh it's if somebody thinks they're drowning in metal lake you just tell them to stand up i mean 
<laughs> that works for some. <laughs> That's happened to me a couple of times I, when I was fishing. I, I'm just sharing a story there. But um, I'm really concerned about that, that if we need to get that shoreline stabilized, and it doesn't seem like it was that long. It was during the Gamble era that we dug it out, which doesn't seem that long ago, but I've had a lot of birthdays since then too, so. Yeah, that's about 20 years, 20, 23 years, 25 years. years. Yeah, but if you think about it, it had never been dredged before that. Right. <laughs> so at that time, it was about three feet deep in some of the deepest parts, so. <laughs> I don't know. That's an expensive project that has a lot of moving parts, and uh, not only have I been told the rock is prohibitively expensive, but I can't imagine where we're going to find to dump that much of what we scrape out. So that's going to be a core, because if you have to drive it any distance, you're going to be spending a lot of money. That's all I can say. We might make some more hills and moguls in Meadow Lake Park. <laughs> Big hills. Big. <laughs> uh, dredging Meadow Lake is going to be quite a chore. Um, the, the stabilization has been a chore. We've talked about it for several years. It's overdue. Um, it, it, we'll be putting together a plan and, and, and talking about it more um, with you to get something executable so that we can move forward because that's the only way we make progress. So. Yeah. Champlain Pool. Again, uh, these are just things that we've talked about. We, and here we're, we're talking about it again, Corey. We're going to limp along. Yeah, come on up, and we're going to limp along again for another year on a 70-year-old pool. Yeah, um, yeah. Its initial lifespan was about 25 years, so we're we're getting by, but we're really going to make some changes pretty quick because that thing is she's a bear. And I think uh, the next slide, I think we might be talking about some of the improvements. This is just some more talk about Champlain Pool. Um, we'll be talking about that more in the future. Again, this is stuff that's not going to happen overnight. It's not, it's not executable um, yet. And so, um, thus the five-year plan. Um, scrolling on down, I think there's some slides in here, Corey, where you're going to talk. Well, maybe they're at the end. Uh, tell you what, we'll go through streets, and then I think gotcha. they must be at the end. I'll be um, here. Yeah, local streets, uh, local streets we've talked about quite a bit. I think we're making significant improvements. Obviously, we all want to make more. Um, the only thing stopping us is resources. Um, these are the streets that we currently have um, that we're working on or complete. So you can look through that. Go ahead, next slide. So you can see there's several slides of streets that have been working on. Um, normally on local streets that are complete rebuilds, uh, those, those go to engineering. Um, they work on those. Those are very expensive, so we typically do a few a year. I think some of the ones that are in the pipeline this year that are being completed, a lot of them are on the east side, um, Maple, Birch, Chestnut, and Tenth. Um, here are some more um, projects that we've done. Those first few, Flint Ridge and Sombrero Circle, those are cul-de-sacs. And I think if you go back one slide, there was a couple more cul-de-sacs. Anyway, we fixed four cul-de-sacs recently. I think a couple were in La Mesa West, a couple were in uh, Garland Park too, um, where the asphalt's falling apart because it was constructed not to very good standards and, and our trash trucks caused massive ruts. So um, these, uh, those areas have asphalt streets. So we'll be following up with some asphalt streets uh, as soon as we can get uh, going again on asphalt. Anyway, keep going because I don't want to bore you with streets, but, but there we've done, done a lot. So I know people say, and I bet you get it every day, fix streets, fix streets. Well, we can never fix them enough, but we fixed a lot of them. So we're going to do a better job of, after we get this refined with your input, getting this out on the website so everybody can see what we've done, what's coming on local, arterial, asphalt, um, cul-de-sacs, intersections, and, and keep going because I think we're talking about traffic system improvements too. That's always an ongoing project. Just keep on going through the street slides. Folks can take a look at those. Darrell, I have a, I have yes, a sir. question. Is this list 
is, is it online somewhere where people can? I don't think we have it online yet. I so think that's it would be a good idea to put it yeah. online because people are calling all the time and asking if their street's ever going to be fixed. And I don't know. I mean, so. We'll try to get that done before the end of the month to get something out there that at least shows them what we're planning on in the next uh, year. And as soon as the five-year list is, is, is ready, we'll put it out there. It won't be every street in town. No. Um, but, but folks, that if they see their street's not on there, feel free to call us because uh, there's a lot of streets that need repair in town. Um, Marley, why don't you talk about the analysis you're doing right now on streets throughout town? Um, one of the challenges we have is uh, picking the right street. I mean, we are not going to be wrong any any street. So, but picking the right street is a challenge. So, um, the current technologies what we have is uh, very expensive just to picking the right location of the street. So, um, there are some new technologies. So, we are going to get the traffic counts for the whole town. Every street going to be finding the traffic counts. So, they are using the current mobile technologies. So, every cell phone has a signal. So there are technologies that cal uh, find out how many s cell phones are traveling in each and every street. So they are going to give us a, um, uh, basically how many vehicles are going on in each and every street at a certain time. So we are using that. And also uh, the other part of the traffic uh, is the condition of the street. So. There is another new technology it's going to be, we are implementing, implementing is uh, uh, the street index factor. So we are driving every street in town and uh, gathering the in street index factor. So we are using both street index and also um, traffic counts and come up with the rating, which streets goes first. So we'll come back and provide you that information. So then we can, um, analytically use the information to pick the right streets. Sounds good. Aren't you also looking at the piping underneath the ground, whether it's on easement or if it's actually underneath the <coughs> street and making your decisions that way too? That's based right. On so that time that, that pipe's been on the ground and yeah. type that, of issues yeah. we have. Yes. That information already in the um, cartograph so all the, wherever the water line breaks are, so we're using that also adds to this uh, complexity in the right streets. The intersection that we just opened at 10th and Chestnut that's about two and a half blocks of great concrete street, right. um, the sewer pipe under that had collapsed, right. had to be replaced. Is there also uh, water stormwater yep. drainage and, and water lines? Yep. And so the, all of that cost about a million dollars, um, but if you haven't seen that yet and you get a chance, go take a look at that. Yeah. Um, while you go that way, take a look at Maple. Uh, we saw Reverend Chick was in here about a month ago raving about that, yeah. which I appreciate. Yeah. Um, great improvement. So um, this tool will help us because we get the question frequently, why that street, why not that street? Right. We're trying to add some analysis to it about why. Well, and then they ran into some stormwater issues between 15th and 16th where the storm drain collapsed yep. while they were redoing the street, which had to add to that project. Yeah. I might mention there were three big projects. The three big projects I was talking about, not counting Call Lake, uh, which is the biggest project, parks, specifically baseball, football, and softball improvements. Um, the downtown, specifically I'm talking what's called in our comp plan, the Civic Spine. It goes from Gary to all the way to the Stride Bank Center. Uh, between Independence and Grand. Clearly, we're not done there. Um, there's some challenges and some impediments there, but we need to move the ball forward on that in this next year. And so I, I look forward to bringing that forward to you as well. There's been fantastic improvements. You know we have the one Christmas tree celebration down there. Um, there's an art feature down there. Um, it's a nice area that can, can be a lot better and, and be um, be a true civic spine for the city of Enid. Next slide. And that's just um, Stride Bank Center. We need to make some maintenance repairs to the Stride Bank Center, particularly Convention Hall, um, in the next fiscal year. And there may be some more. Marley, would you talk about those so that we all know? Yeah. Um, the, uh, I think the main um, concern in the uh, Stride Bank like, uh, Convention Hall is uh, uh, the weatherproofing. 
So we have a lot of uh, damages inside the building without, because of the weather, uh, the rain infiltration. So we are looking into weatherproofing the building and also working on um, uh, seeing the there is any chance of replacing the uh, windows. So these are the two things we are looking at. And um, the roof is in good shape, but there are a couple things, a uh, few items that needs to be uh, worked on. So we are working with the contractor uh, to see if we can replace, uh, temporarily use an extension of the life of the roof. Um, and the Stride Bank Center, um, the building is already almost 10 years old. And uh, uh, any roof is uh, last 20 years. Uh, with the r right weather, but Oklahoma has some tough weather. So um, the next 10 years, there might be another uh, chance of working with the roof uh, on the strike bank. So there are, it's, um, so we need to look into that stuff. Mm -hmm. So the weatherproofing on, uh, <coughs> that the building is on, done on the outside and it would just be the old original convention hall. Uh, and uh, so, the last time we bid that out, it came in too high. Uh, do we think that's going to go down, or <laughs> just do a part of it at a time, or? That's, where, uh, that's what we are looking into, like just do the east and west or north and south, like whatever mm -hmm. the bad parts of it, then we can, uh, uh, depend on the budget of alloc allocation, we will keep increasing the project. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say uh, that <laughs> the improvements in the parking lot by where the one was done uh, and the ice skating, that really worked out well. I mean, it, it just the tr everything moved much better. It was safer for everybody. Uh, we did that in-house, didn't we? Right. So, you know, I mean, that was, <coughs> that's, that's a big deal. Just little minor tweak, you know, tweaking things every once in a while. That, that's good, good stuff. Well, the ADA compliable from the parking lot mm -hmm. over to the building across. Yes. Yeah. Was parking another lot. fantastic yeah. in-house setup that we did. So, and that benefited a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to Commissioner Stallings for that recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And right. I'd like to say one thing, Gerald. We invested in a new machine. We did. The streets. We did. You didn't mention it, but I remember it, and it cost a pretty good penny. I think it was around three hundred thousand dollars. I could tell you. I give you a quick update on the machine. The machine is sitting in our streets department, ready to go. But unfortunately, it was delivered to us from the vendor and the manufacturer with a few things that are wrong with it. So we're in the process. Just talked to them today in a follow up. Um, they will be getting that fixed for us. In the meantime, they're going to bring us back our old machine so we can still get busy uh, getting after the uh, asphalt. So the good news is it's here. It's kind of some bad news that it's not quite correct yet. Um, no fault of our own. Um, the manufacturer did not and the dealer didn't bring it to us correct. So that should be fixed within the next, uh, it may be a couple of months. But in the meantime, we'll have our old machine so we can get back and get busy. Uh, so it is on the way. Yes, Commissioner, it, it is. And it will be good. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, Randolph, uh, Scott, you want to talk about Randolph real quickly and what's going on there over the next five years? You bet. You might have, you might have noticed the, uh, the, the one-way corridor in between Van Buren and Johnson Street on Randolph and James. Um, over the last few years, there's been more and more of, the, of some of those homes and lots that we've demolished, that we've started to purchase. And we do have a long-term plan for Randolph. As we're all aware, Randolph is one of the only streets where you can go all the way from Garland to 30th Street. And so it's an important street in Enid, and uh, it's, it's actually got a, got a lot of traffic that goes down it, and not only for aesthetics, but for, but for ease of use. Uh, we, we, want, we want to uh, upgrade and improve in four lane as much of Randolph in the future as we can. And so we've begun the process of, of people that are ready to sell and when they get a renter out of there or if they're considering um, we have there are 36 lots in between Van Buren and Johnson and we've purchased 17 of those so far uh, we have demolished houses on 16 out of 17 of those so there's one that we've bought recently that we haven't demolished yet and there are 19 lots left available and so over the next few years um, we are we're going to be planning on funding in the 23-24 budget to purchase about 10 more properties 
Um, I've, I've talked to uh, at least six of those lot owners that are ready to sell whenever I have the funds available. And so I think we can move on some of these fairly quickly and see more improvement in the area. So I'll go ahead and move to the next slide. The next few years, we're 23. I think we're going to try to get about half of them. 24, we're going to put enough budget to buy whatever's left, hopefully. Um, of course, this is all contingent upon uh, council approving the budgets that we put together. 2025, once the properties are completed, then we can turn the keys over to engineering and have them uh, begin designing some infrastructure replacements because, as we just talked about, if we're going to put in a nice new roadway, we don't want to have water lines and sewer lines and things underneath that brand new concrete. So uh, engineering always likes to, uh, to do utility infrastructure movement ahead of the streets. So we'll put that in the budget, get the design done, start to move some money in the next 25-26 budget, hopefully for some infrastructure movement. And then uh, next year after that, you know, hopefully get the construction done on infrastructure and begin to put money in the budget sometime in 2027 or after to actually start putting in a brand new Randolph right there between Johnson and Van Buren. So that's one of the plans that I'm excited about that I think our residents will get excited about and make things travel smoother and look even better. So that's kind of an update for Randolph. Next slide. Next one. Okay, next. Keep going through all that stuff. We should get this of the short term park improvements. Okay, stop right there. Thank you. Um, wastewater. Um, we're going to need to probably in the next five years start working on and probably break ground on a new sewer solids processing plant. Back in about 2012, uh, 2011, we built a brand new wastewater treatment plant out at the current site, um, but it only we, we, it, processes, it processes the solids when they come in, but it diverts them over to the old plant that was built in about 86 to process. We constantly, I won't say constantly, but we have issues. Um, Marley, why don't you talk about what needs to happen? Uh, in 2007, when we built a brand new sewer plant, um, we did only the liquid side, not the solids. Um, that the liquids train, uh, it cost over $35 million. Uh, we did not, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the solids needs to be upgraded. Like right now, the solids train is um, uh, built in 1986, and uh, it has a lot of challenges. Um, the current uh, technology, uh, it's, not, it, uh, it's not supporting what the, uh, the flows that are coming in. Um, uh, they uh, we have the land south of the existing uh, sewer plant. Um, the next five years, we need to look into building a brand new solids handling. Uh, uh, there are in the budget, there is already um, replacing the existing belt press that uh, press the solids, but uh, the existing belt press also it's in um, tail end of the uh, useful life. Um, and uh, the digesters, there are four digesters currently, and uh, those are all uh, concrete uh, tanks and uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, issues with it. Uh, overall, um, the solids handling requires a lot of maintenance currently, and um, in the next five years, uh, we'll be looking into providing some designs and uh, upgrades to that system. And you want to talk about the landfill a little bit too? Yep, um, uh, the existing landfill, um, we have a methane uh, concern, but uh, this park, came into the board uh, and uh, they are working on uh, uh, installing the collection system. So by next 2024, the, uh, it will be in operation. Um, and also the existing landfill has about 10 years lifespan. And also uh, we need to work on um, expanding a new, a new, new site. And in this current year budget, we already, I mean, you already approved for a new site permit and we are working on that. It takes about five years to get a permit, and uh, within the next uh, 10 years, we'll have a new site to build, uh, build on. Okay, I think the next slide talks about the spark methane plant, which we just talked about. We'll head to the next slide. 
Water lines, you're well aware of what's going on with Fiona Mitchell, uh, Randolph Cherokee. Um, next slide, we ended up doing about four water lines as you remember. Uh, you want? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are four, uh, we got four million dollars a loan, and one out of four million, one million is a loan for Guinness. Um, the first project is under construction, which is a Leona Mitchell project. It is $1.5 million, and we got uh, still $2.5 million left over. And uh, there are three projects. Uh, they are designed and getting permitted. Well, one is a Randolph, next Cherokee, and Oklahoma. So these projects will be pretty soon will be going out to bid. Um, so these are the four projects out of what loan for Guinness project. And those, those are the two that are running from basically the hospital all the way out to Lakeside? 20th Street, yes. 20th. Oklahoma and Cherokee, yes. Mm -hmm. Now will improve the water pressure in that area for the fire department? Obviously. <coughs> that program is still, that's an ongoing annual program, so likely we'll be putting a package together to ask for more money in the form of a loan. It's a low interest loan, and it comes with loan forgiveness. So you'll remember for $4 million worth of new water lines, we only are going to end up having to pay back $3 million, and we plan to pay that back over four years, I think, a four-year payback time frame. Um, I think we just have a couple more slides. Uh, communication. Um, Scott, you want to talk about these things? You bet. I'm really excited about uh, this opportunity with Neptune. Um, we are participating in, um, in, among, in several other cities are too, in a beta testing for a, uh, a software that would allow all of the residents in Enid to be able to log in and view their hourly, daily water consumption. And also set up alerts so that if you're on vacation, you can be notified if there's any water use, or you can set a daily maximum allowable. And if something's going amiss in your, in your home and you're using too much water, you can, you can get an alert. So we're being a, we're a, we're a part of a beta testing system right now for the next few months through the end of April, and uh, hopefully later on this year they'll have that offered to us and we can subscribe to that and offer that to our citizens. So later on this year in 2023 we'll be able to give that solution, and I'm sure some of you commissioners may have had a call from some of your your people that are concerned about usage, and this will be a tool they can use to monitor their own usage and catch problems before they become big problems. So I'm really excited about this. Um, technology has just moved along. When we first started the system, all of, uh, all of this data was held in our own servers. And now we've eventually, as technology's you know, evolved, all of this information's out there in a cloud. And it's much easier to have a system like this that the public can get access to. And it, it's it looks very user friendly. I've I've seen what uh, what the beta is going to be like. The final problem product is probably going to be very similar to that. So I'm looking forward to that very much. City Connect is another thing I want to briefly hit. It's something that we are doing this year, and it's going to start as a City of Enid internal um, technology, and it will likely evolve to something that the community can be involved in. But what it's going to do for us is it's going to allow each department head to be able to give a feed to every one of them that are in their department. You know, the, uh, the fire department's got maybe 70 or 80 employees. I don't know what the total is. 84. 84 employees. So any employee that has one of these, you can give a news feed and say, hey, here's what's going on. Here's the important things. Here's Bob's retirement party. You know, everyone can be notified of things. Um, any user will have a directory of every city of Enid employee that's out there and um, department heads and, and directors will be able to recall people um, in case of emergencies. There's all kinds of really good things that can happen. If there's a snowstorm, we need people to come in from other departments and run over time, you can send out an alert that says, hey, show up here at this time and we gotta do this. If there could be a natural emergency where maybe this building gets taken out by a tornado, we can direct all city staff, here's where we need to be, here's what we need to do. So there's a whole lot of functionality including training um, and all kinds of opportunity that we can use City Connect for. Uh, Vance Air Force Base already uses a system called Base Connect that's very sim that's des designed by the same people so I'm looking forward to what the opportunities are and I'm also looking forward to see how in the future after we get it um, after we get used to using it you know what the capabilities to release that to some of the public will be so those are a few of the things that are happening this year in 2023 that 
I think I'm excited about and to see how much it's going to improve customer service to our residents. Next slide. Keep going. Um, we've already talked about economic development, uh, movie theaters. You guys approved a deal several meetings ago. Um, we're working on a retail development <laughs> in the district. Clearly, Oakwood Malls, I hear about a lot. That's That's got to be a joint uh, project working with uh, our partners, ERDA, other folks. Mayor, you want to talk about the trip that you just went on recently? <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, City of Lawton has a mall that was much like our mall, uh, and they were trying to find a way to be able to better utilize that. Well, they partnered with Fort Sill, who was looking for a place to expand some of their classified uh, data processing and information and vendors. And so what they decided to do is use part of the mall as Fort Sill, part of it as retail redevelopment, and they were able to get uh, government loans for that because of that. They were able to get some grants. So they had some opportunities available, and we thought, well, if they figure out how to do it, maybe we could do something like that as well. So we went down, took a look at it, uh, spent about a day down there uh, looking around. So there'll be more coming on that. What we can't do, they had an immediate need for uh, some room for Fort Sill, which prompted them to do that. What we can't do is, you know, get the structure and hope we find something to put in it. We gotta have a mission before we, we start <coughs> obligating anything. So we're kind of looking at that and seeing how that'll work. But I, it's a good idea that works somewhere else and if anybody's got a good idea, I think we ought to look at it and see if we, we can use that as well. So. Yeah, and, and so I think there's a few more slides. Corey, I, I think we failed to get your slides and you wanna just come up and address some of the issues that we've done. Yeah, I'll let you know some of the, the short-term things we did when uh, after the, the spring season last year, um, there was some issues with the lips on the ball fields. We got a new tool. Um, it is an implement that goes on the back of a tractor. It's kind of like a vertical slicer with a roller behind it that remo actually removes lips on ball fields. So we did go through and do that. Uh, there were some issues with some backstops that were beat up really bad. So we removed those, got new backstops up. We also added two by 12 boards on the sides, on the first and third base sides, and then some padding on, on the the backstops directly behind the home plate. Um, we've still got some more dirt work to do. We'll wait till after their spring season is over because of course we'll have to do a lot of dirt leveling and we're gonna wanna make sure that we're able to grow a side back after that. And if we did that now, we'd have a big muddy mess out there. So we do have some more drainage issues that we wanna tackle after they're done at the end of June. So that's about the perfect time. Um, there are some high wear areas uh, just outside the dugouts, uh, the on, on deck batting areas where the batters are out there before they go on base. And uh, we've added some uh, artificial turf circles there and we're, gonna, we're in the process of adding some just outside the dugouts to, to help alleviate some of these high wear areas. So we're working, we still got a lot to do uh, and I'm really excited to be part of this five year plan and, and see some growth and start building some new facilities out there, especially bathrooms. So. Uh, Corey, you've been working closely with, the, in fact, you normally go to EGRT meetings, but I asked you to be here tonight, so you couldn't be at their meeting, but yeah. um, you've been working closely with them, so I think they're well aware of what you're doing. Yes. And, okay. Just met with Kenyon, the baseball director, yesterday. We walked the whole complex, kind of came up with some plans. So, yeah, the communication on both sides has gone really well. We could probably talk some more on this, but I know we have one more little item that won't take a lot of time, I think, but what feedback do you have for us? This won't be the last time we're talking about it. You're going to do it. <laughs> As we refine this, and clearly if we're going to move forward, we're going to have to have some budget items, so you're going to hear about it yeah. more and, uh, before budget time and during budget time, so. Okay. No. Good overview. Appreciate it. All right. Item 3.5, discuss EPTA advisory board ordinance. Carol? Well, um, in recent years, um, we have been successful in receiving some federal funding dollars through the state for transportation of low-income persons over 60 years old. Well, no grant comes without requirements, and one of the requirements is to utilize an advisory board of very particular people to provide impact input on the transportation needs for older Americans. And uh, the members of the advisory board cannot be employed by an agency that has received these um, aging or old American funds 
and um, it can't be the EPTA trust members, and it can't be city employees. And 50% of the board must meet certain very specific personal criteria that that is why if you look at the ordinance, um, we are going to uh, have the EPTA trust manager, who is Mr. Gilbert, select the people because if we were to advertise and put it on an agenda, it's, you know, it's talking about disabilities, income, uh, health, whether you're living alone, whether there's a danger of institutionalization in the future. So the thought is we'll find some people that work and we'll, uh, we'll ask them to serve rather than uh, put all that information and have it be a public record. Uh, and um, I think that I'm going to change it and just have a small board of three people because 50% of the people right. have to <coughs> be of this category and it just will make it easier. If, if it's four people, then, you know, um, it still has to, they still have to be, two of them right. have these requirements. And that's it, and I'll bring it back um, uh, next one, meeting. One other thing, Carol, uh, 713.3 uh, under meetings, it said in accordance with provisions of Oklahoma Meeting Act, is that supposed to be Oklahoma Open Meeting Act? I, yes. I don't know. I don't know what the formal Sure. Um, I, but but that's, that's what we're talking about. We're okay. talking about the All same right. thing. Yes. All right. Good. Good catch, Mayor. Yep. That's all I've seen. Any questions from anybody else? Okay. Thank you. That uh, that completes our meeting. We're going to take about a 15-minute break. We'll gather back here at uh, 6.36. We're adjourned.